Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I know the rest of you will be getting your seats soon. My name is Jim Anderson, and I am the proud president of Peace Action New York State. And I am indeed uh, full of joy to MC tonight and welcome you to another great event hosted by Peace Action New York State. In fact, it's probably our greatest event every year, the William Sloan Coffin Peacemaker Awards event. Um, there is so many folks here to be esteemed, to be highlighted, but I won't do it. Just know that you all are stars. And you know, when peace people get together, you really have a nice party. And we're going to have a party because we've got a lot of good things going on tonight besides the awards. I want to say two special things that I would be remiss in doing if I didn't. You know, in the Black church tradition, there's a song that they used to sing that says, may the work I've done speak for me. And our awardees are certainly those kind of folks. And as we get ready to go deeper into the program, I, I, I want the two things I really want to mention, the first one is this. Carol Hurston. Not only was she radiant in so many ways, but when you think about may the work I've done speak for me, uh, she is truly one who exceeded the words of that song, because everything she did showed that she not only put her heart into it, if you know Carol, you know the work she's done, and you know the sincerity. And we in the Peace family, Peace Action New York State, are pleased to announce that Carol was so unique and so loving of Peace Action New York State. And that leads me to say, you know, she, she always set a lesson for us all. As you age, aging is just a number. We still got things we can do. And one thing we know about getting the work done that it takes fuel. We don't need no coal. Uh, wind power won't do it, but wind power helps. We need clean energy, that means a spirit that understands the cause we're fighting for, but we also need contributions. And Carol uh, really blew us away with her generous, just, I mean, just outstanding gift to Peace Action New York State. And I would like to say on both sides of transition, you know, um, Sometimes we think about after we're gone, but it's while we're here, the work that we do while we're here that matters. And she did that with a very generous gift to Peace Action New York State, to the work that we all do. And I wanted to point that out because sometimes you'll be surprised. Um, she left footprints that we can all walk in. And so I want to just say that, and on behalf of Carol's family, uh, I just want to extend our deep, deep, humble thanks for your family member and our family member and just say thank you and let that be um, an action we all remember. The other thing, yes, indeed. The other thing I want to say that I need to mention, you know there's been a lot of stuff in the news, but the one thing I want to talk about in the news, you heard about some boat people that were apprehended and many in the peace family worried because it was one of our family members. So I'm pleased to announce that present with us today back off the boat not too long ago, Colonel Ann Wright who is here today. And I do, I do want to take a special moment and ask Colonel Ann Wright to come forward and just at least say one or two words, just a little bit while you're here, please. It's, uh, it's great to be back here in the United States of America after the women's boat to Gaza uh, was apprehended on international waters uh, 34 miles off the coast of Gaza where we were going on a mission to bring hope to the people of Gaza who have been suffering under a brutal, brutal, illegal uh, naval blockade of Gaza for many, many decades now. 
Uh, there, we had 13 women from 13 countries on board uh, the last leg of this 1,715 mile journey. We started out in Barcelona, Spain. The first leg went from Barcelona, Spain to Ajaccio, uh, Corsica, and the second leg, uh, and second leg from Ajaccio to Messina, Sicily, and then the last leg from Messina on to, uh, to Gaza. Uh, I want to thank all of you all who have supported so much all the flotillas, and in fact I was talking to someone that um, six years ago, after the 2010 flotilla, in which the IDF tragically killed nine activists, and actually another one has subsequently died, 10 activists and wounded over 50, uh, put 700 people in jail. Uh, the first place after we and the U.S. returned from that, the first place for me was actually right here. Uh, you all hosted a, a wonderful evening where we could explain what had happened and then laid the plans for the 2011 Gaza Freedom Flotilla in which 10 ships attempted to uh, leave Greece and go to break the uh, Israeli blockade of Gaza. So this, this church has a great meaning, I think, for many of these actions and for all of you all who have supported the Gaza Flotillas over the many, many years, we want to thank you. And please keep remembering, as we, as we are here tonight, um, the, the one real memory I will always carry with me of this flotilla was as we were having been boarded by the IDF. Um, uh, and an interesting thing in terms of they didn't board us using combat equipment as they had done in previous times. They recognized that we were a boat of unarmed civilian women that had come 1,700 miles in a small boat. They boarded us wearing baseball caps, long-sleeved jerseys, a vest, and a GoPro. And it was a totally different experience. We, some of the young, half of the people that boarded, the 15 that boarded our little boat were women, women sailors in the IDF. And as we talked to these young people, they said, you know, we, had, we, we acknowledge and kind of admire the journey you've been on. As sailors, we know it was a long, tough journey. We may not agree with the policies that you're trying to change, but we do respect what the manner in which you have done it. And as we approached uh, Gaza, Actually, we kept going toward Gaza before we turned to the, the Israeli port of, of uh, Ashdod. The, the stark difference between the industrial state, the very cosmopolitan state of Israel, with the great bright lights along its coastline that went to the north, and the solid darkness, a distinct line, a solid darkness that went to the south, that's Gaza. The people in Gaza are in the dark. They are in the dark because the electricity, the water, all of these things are controlled by the state of Israel and are only allowed in whenever Israel wants it. The people of Gaza deserve more and I thank you all for keeping them in your minds. The whole point of the flotilla was to bring international attention to the continuation of the blockade and I think we did that. We will continue these, these flotillas until those blockades are ended. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Yes. You know, if you got to go on a cruise, a cruise for peace is the best way to go. And it does take heart and commitment, and we thank you, Colonel Ann Wright. Let me move on and move you to a Friday. Um, some folks may be waiting for it right away. I, no, I'm just kidding. We're going to start serving food. They're going to call you up by table. Um, sh someone will, will uh, let you know when your table is up. But in the meantime, we'll just continue on. So here's where we're going next. We're going to deal with our student update. And I want to introduce, I don't even have to introduce her. I want to call her forward. She is probably the brightest star, one of the brighter stars in our office, Kate Alexander. And um, she had, Kate, come forward, come forward. Kate is, is um, 
extraordinary. Um, Kate and Sylvia, the work they do in our office, you would think that we had just a whole bunch of people. They are a whole bunch of people in the work you do. Kate, come on for it. And she's going to take us forward on this student update, and then we'll do more later. Thank you. Oh geez, every time Jim introduces me, it's like, can I live up to that? Oh my gosh. Um, okay, so first of all, before I get to the students, and it is always my sort of great, my really true privilege to be able to highlight their work for all of you each year, um, I have to talk about Judy and Cora because they have been such exceptional women to be able to work alongside in the last year year and a half that I've been here. Um, Judy is truly a matriarch of our peace community. <laughs> and I was so welcomed by her from the, from the instant that I became a part of this. And I will never be, I could never extend my full gratitude to her. And <laughs> Judy, with her kindness, is matched by Cora and her kindness and toughness and her exceptional, her exceptional expectations and her exceptional work. I probably wouldn't be a part of the peace community without the work that Cora has done in the past. Um, when I, I had the privilege before I joined Peace Action to do peace work in the field, which I think is where we see how our work matters and who it affects. And when I was in Bosnia, I was doing war crimes research, and I referenced Cora's work <laughs> when I was in Uganda and working with communities in northwestern Ramogi, when I saw that women were the population that's left and the population left to carry the torch, when I saw how they are left out of the peace process because of existing patriarchal values of the society. I remembered Cora's work. And today, while I am somehow balancing Columbia and peace action, and we're working on our report to the UN Security Council with, to, about Iraq and about making sure that we recognize crimes against gender non-conforming persons, women who are persecuted because they were in the political realm and they are women, LGBTIQ persons, we are once again referencing Cora's work. So uh, first of all, I have, to thank, I have to take another moment here to thank the incredible work of the woman who blazed the trail in peace activism, the woman who blazed the trail in peace field work. All right, so without further ado, I'd like to turn this attention to our student organizers who are a continuation of the work of Cora and Judy in so many ways. I barely know how to mention them, and I have a limited time, so I'll try to be brief. In the past year, our student organizers have done some of the most incredible organizing I've ever been a part of. Um, last year, we had 10 chapters completely supported with the incredible generosity of the Carl Lesner Foundation. And Ken Esty, if you could stand up. I don't know where you are in this room. <laughs> okay, Ken Esty is back there, and I would just like to say an incredible thank you for your support. It is through the incredible support of individuals using where they are to do what they can that our student organizing program exists and that's been able to, to grow. What we started a few years ago with a few chapters, this year, has turned into 14 chapters in communities across the country. We have chapters in Saratoga Springs, Buffalo, all the way down to Long Island, who organized an incredible day of events around the debate at Hofstra. But we're here today to focus on a f the exceptional of, the student, of the, our student work. And there's a few chapters that I have to highlight. At Peace Action, Hobart Williams Smith, there was a, an event on Palestinian refugee identities. An intimate dinner with three tables that accommodated in total 75 people, where each table had a different Palestinian with a different refugee identity, who spoke with students openly about what they're able to do. 
And unfortunately, due to Cuomo's, or Cuomo's executive order, that kind of activism would no longer be allowed at SUNY schools. But other work, and other work has continued and is exceptional. At, uh, <laughs> I don't, even, I don't even know where to start because I'm so proud of all of them, but I have to mention SUNY Binghamton, which is finally about to establish their Peace Studies minor on their campus, having finally found, yeah. Yeah, uh, they finally found an academic department that isn't telling them that their Peace Studies minor is too pacifist for the program. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> My disbelief is your disbelief. And at, and at Canisius College, two events that they started in their first year as student chapter have become annual events on their campus. A peace day and a human rights symposium so showcasing the work of student activists as they work in the field doing peace work all over the world. And it gives them a community to celebrate that work and to move it forward. But the student chapter that we're honoring tonight is so exceptional, it's hard to put into words. Um, when I visited SUNY Albany last year, and I've said this a million times to people who have heard this, it felt like anyone in that room could have been an organizer. And I think the people who have been in activist communities know how exceptionally rare that is for people to build a self-sustaining community of activists who take care of each other while taking care of the rest of the planet as best they can. It's truly a privilege to be able to acknowledge their work tonight and to be able to introduce the man who is going to present them with the Donald Schaefer Student Peacemaker Award, and that is Robert Schaefer. Robert Schaefer. Thank you, Kate. I'm very pleased to be able to present this second annual Donald Schaefer Student Peacemaker Award, which the Peace Action Fund of New York State has generally, generously named in memory of my father, who died in February 2013, after a lifetime of dedication to the peace movement and to progressive politics. Donald served as national treasurer of the Political Action Committee of SANE in the mid and late 1980s, and he was a fervent advocate of the merger between SANE and the nuclear freeze campaign, uh, which of course became peace action. Uh, Donald showed commitment to local activism, uh, especially in his later work for a decade or so before his death, as he advocated for a commitment by New York Peace Action to build student chapters. And before I go to the award, if I might add two personal notes about uh, two of the women who are, um, uh, two of the other women being honored tonight. One of my various, very earliest memories is of spending a day in the backyard of the home of Cora and Peter Weiss. And I'm pretty certain that the adults on this occasion, including my parents, of course, were engaged in important political discussions or strategizing uh, while we played on a tire swing and other things in the back. Uh, also, Donald and my mother, Doris, uh, were good friends, political associates, and summer neighbors in the Berkshires of Carol Houston. And my family and I join with others in Peace Action to offer our condolences to Carol's family. So to move on to uh, this award, for its work during the 2015-2016 academic year, the University at Albany, SUNY chapter, under the leadership of student organizer Michelle Diacampo, has been selected for the Donald Schaefer Student Peacemaker Award. Uh, the University at Albany chapter focused a lot of its attention in 2015-2016 on the important and very timely issue of the reception of refugees in the United States. As Donald Trump and others worked as hard as they could to demonize refugees fleeing war-torn countries, our SUNY Albany students worked to welcome them. In particular, on Refugee Visibility Day, 
the chapter partnered with 18 on and off campus organizations to raise awareness of the plight of refugees. And in this single day event, they collected 91 pages of signatures calling on President Obama to accept more refugees in this country. The students in the chapter also worked for several months to develop a refugee journey simulation which guided students through the various steps, uh, rigorous steps of the refugee journey, uh, the refugee process. And over 150 students participated in this event. Finally, and also with regard to refugees, our students have volunteered with individual refugees themselves. SUNY Albany chapter members regularly work one-on-one -on -one with local refugees to help them overcome barriers to accessing higher education, including navigating the college and scholarship application processes. In other work, the University at Albany chapter enthusiastically engaged with Upper Peace Action, Upper Hudson Peace Action, and the Peace Action Fund of New York State. For the Global Day Against Military Spending, they partnered with Upper Hudson for an on-campus protest and speaker. They sent large groups of student activists to the Peace Action New York State annual meeting and to the National Peace Action meeting in Washington, D.C. Aaron Giolonella has taken over at SUNY Albany uh, as the student organizer, uh, given Michelle Diacampo's graduation in May. Uh, but I will add, I must add, that with her graduation, Michelle has stepped up her activism with Peace Action as the upstate co-chair of the steering committee of the Peace Action Fund of New York State. So I offer my congratulations to Michelle Diacampo, who is accepting the award on behalf of the chapter, and to all the members of the University at Albany Student Peace Action Chapter. I didn't prepare anything, but um, I was part of um, University at Albany Peace Action since my freshman year when there were only three students. Um, and now, like Kate said, our um, chapter has grown to have um, over 50 students, um, and all of them have the capability to be student organizers. Um, we really seek at our chapter to cultivate um, the passion that students have surrounding peace and social justice and giving them all the tools they can to be strong organizers and advocates for peace throughout their lifetime, whether that means through a career or through their extracurricular work. So we're really happy with the work that our amazing students have produced. And thank you very much for the award. <laughs> There you are. The future is now. Thank you, Robert. And thank you, Kate. By the way, in case you didn't know it, Kate is our, she is the Director of Policy and Outreach for Peace Action New York State. And I don't, I don't like to brag, but I, I can tell you Peace Action New York State got the best two workers in the office in the world. I'm just, I'm just telling you the truth. Just being truthful. Bragging a little bit, but being truthful. Um, are they ready for us with the meal? Like first. Say again. Like oh, come on back, Kate. It ain't over. <laughs> this is my favorite part of the night. <laughs> um, so our students are exceptional, which I hope that you've seen here. And anytime, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be honest with, with all, the, all the folks in this room right now. Anytime any of your friends tell you that millennials don't 
pay attention or aren't involved, I need you to stand up for these kids. And I'm sorry to call you kids because I'm basically one of you. Um, but I need you to stand up for them. I need that because every time you're in a room where someone says millennials don't pay attention, their power is robbed. Because the first battle that we lose with people in caring about politics is them believing that their voice doesn't matter. And when you're in a room and you hear someone say millennials don't participate, check and see if there's a millennial in that room because you're creating the expectation. So there's more that you can do and there's more that we need you to do, unfortunately, too. But maybe very fortunately, <laughs> because our students have had the extraordinary opportunity over the past year as our network has grown to come together and to really define what they need from us to support their work. And what they have said they need is more opportunities to come together as their own network, to share best case practices, to figure out what works in organizing their peers and what does not to discuss these issues openly as student academics and as student activists who are trying, who are learning about these issues for many for the first time and deciding how they want to be involved. And because they've asked us to step up in their abilities to connect with each other, we're going to. But we need you to as well. So tonight, we are <laughs> giving out tickets. Specifically, you can sponsor bus tickets for the Student Peace Action Conference. This is the first annual conference of its kind ever in the Peace Action Network. It's going to bring together activists from Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey, and I think there are a couple of people joining us from Canada, and we have to help them get there. So, for the cost of $500, you can sponsor 10 activists to get there from Buffalo. So who will sponsor 10 activists from Buffalo for the student conference? Thank you so much, Cora. <laughs> and who can sponsor? Oh, and there's another. All right, thank you, David. $500 could also sponsor 50 activists from the New York area. Oh, thank you so much, and I'm sorry I don't know your name. <laughs> thank you so much. All right. $500. $500. <laughs> Thank you. Carol's nephew. Thank you, Carol's nephew. What a fitting tribute. $500. It's not even the cost of going to Disney World. That's true, David. <laughs> $500 could also. Thank you, John. I can't tell you what a difference it makes for these students to act together in the same room. It was because of the opportunity for students to work together collaboratively that we knew that not we, not we actually, Aaron, who you met earlier, <laughs> came up to me and said that this was something that they need. Students working together creates change. And if you don't, or if your friends don't believe me, you can look at the Keystone Pipeline, which I'm sorry, you can't actually look at because of student activists. <laughs> All right, and $250 will bring 10 students from, oh gosh, from Saratoga Springs, from the Skidmore. Thank you so much, $250.
250 would also bring 10 students from Geneseo to Albany. What an exceptional opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm seeing another hand. Oh, thank you, $250, thank you. <laughs> All right. I think we're waiting for our volunteers to get to everyone who's raised. Can you raise your hand if you've raised your hand so far? Thank you so much. <laughs> and also thank you for your patience. <laughs> Excellent. Um, all right, so $250 would also bring 10 students from Long Island. These are 10 students who work to bring together the Hofstra debate. And here's another organizer pledging that amount. Margaret, thank you so much. All right, all right, I'm not gonna be up here a lot longer, so if you're feeling generous, now's the time because I'm bringing it down to $100. $100 will definitely bring 10 students from New York, or it'll help feed our students in Albany, and you know that students could use that. Heidi, thank you so much. <laughs> 100 students, is that? <laughs> Oh, Roberta, are you pledging? Roberta, thank you so much. $100. Another 100, thank you. The Houston family, incredible. Another 100, thank you so much. And another 100. <laughs> All right. And Joanne, we've got one over here too. Oh, and it, was that another hundred and back? Another hundred and back, thank you. Oh my God, wait, are those, how many hands are back there? <laughs> 300 in that back table, thank you so much. Is that? Colonel Wright. Woo! <laughs> Colonel Wright, thank you. Thank you. Oh my goodness. For the people who never stop giving, am I right? <laughs> All right. 200. <laughs> 200, thank you. And I have to tell you, it's such a privilege to be able to look at, the, look at this from the bird's eye view of all of our student organizers in 14 communities. It's incredible to work with a population of people, just people who are academically curious and creatively activist. They are shaping what peace activism can look like in New York State, including Peace Action Manhattan, which last year put up an actual border on its campus in the form of a six foot chain link fence to protest illegal borders in this world. Yeah. <laughs> They're all exceptional, and truly with students, as many of you may remember from your own student days, every last penny makes a difference. It's the difference between us being able to provide them with their transportation, not just for this conference, but for their annual meeting in DC, for the annual New York State meeting. It's the difference between being able to provide students with financial support when needed, and, or being able to provide our students with the swag that gets students actually, that catches their eye on campus, like the pin I'm wearing now, and which any of you can get in the back. We have a lot. <laughs> Thank you, another 100. <laughs> so what we're going to do right now is with any change that you have, in your, with, is let's see if we can make some change with your change. Sally Jones, our always intrepid board chair, has a basket. <laughs> and we're gonna pass around this basket because all the loose change put together can make real change for our student organizing program. And that's the last bad pun you'll get from me tonight, I promise. <laughs> And I think that's it. So Sally is going to pass this around. And Sally will, and Joanne will pass this around while we're eating. Is that, and we can get food while you're eating. But if you want to get up now, 
Yeah. yeah. You want to call some tables? And grab some food. If the tables on this side of the room want to come up and grab your food, we'll get the rest of the night started shortly. So manja manja, and here we go. Um, if you can make small contributions with just the change in your pockets, it can go a long way. Thank you so much, and eat up. Indeed, thank you so much. So uh, tables to the side of the room can go up. You know, I, I want to say while you're heading up, you know, you ever be at a moment where you, you kind of want to let things continue on? I just want to add an additional thank you on behalf of all our student chapters, on behalf of, of the Office of Peace Action New York State. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, Peace Action, the national organization, has grown. Um, we, there used to be Peace Action and Peace Action West. And this year we completed our merger. And in that completion of the merger, we have, we have established a strong leadership. And I'm going to be introducing and bringing to the microphone in just a second, uh, as I feel like I got everyone's attention. I am proud and honored to introduce to some of you and those of you who already know him, uh, he is extraordinary. He has a legacy of leadership, and he is the captain of the ship for us in the Peace Action family. And that is none other than the National Executive Director of Peace Action, our national organization, John Rainwater. All right. All right, John, it's all yours. Okay, thank you, sir. Thanks so much, Jim, uh, and thanks for your, for your leadership. I was just, um, when I was invited to this event, I was very, very excited, um, wanted to move some things around in order to be here, and one of the, the main reasons that I was excited is that uh, the board of Peace Action and the staff had long been talking about honoring Judy's work for the organization. So I bring bearing Judy uh, with me uh, regards from board members around the, the country and, uh, and staff as well. So we really appreciate your leadership. Um, you really combine that global vision of what's going on all over the world with uh, action both here in New York and around the world, um, acting uh, locally, acting globally, and thinking globally. Um, so I also wanted to thank, uh, and this is one of the other reasons I was excited to be here, is uh, we are hearing about uh, the work of Peace Action in New York, New York State. And uh, what you may or may not know is how important this state affiliate of Peace Action is for the entire peace movement around the country. And um, it really uh, has created a model in the student work that you heard a little bit about it, but I wanted to underline how important it is to other state affiliates and that um, it's, it's people are talking about it as the PANIS model and they want to get to know how to do this kind of student organizing to build uh, the next generation or, or cultivate the next generation of leadership in the peace movement. And, and we all know how important that is because we need a broader peace movement. We need a more diverse peace movement. We need a peace movement that's growing and growing. Um, and uh, I want to thank Panis for, for doing that work. Um, and their work was also exemplary on the Iran deal. You've got this supersized uh, congressional de delegation here in New York, and you brought on one after another uh, convert to that diplomatic uh, deal. And at the same time, like diplomats sometimes have to do, you know how to play hardball. And when a certain uh, New York senator came out in opposition to the deal, uh, Peace Action of New York State was out there protesting, uh, getting visibility in the media and social media that put other senators on notice. So thank you for doing that work and thanks to everybody here who's supporting that work. And God knows when you look around the world today, 
that we desperately need a strong peace movement. The, this week uh, marks, as I think everybody here knows, the 50th anniversary of the Afghanistan war. M maybe most of the United States doesn't know that, but we know that. And at the same time, peace action is fighting escalation in places like Syria and Liber Libya and Iraq. And what all of that says to me is that we need a fundamental paradigm shift in this country. And that's the other reason why I'm really honored to be here uh, sharing this podium with some amazing, amazing women uh, celebrating women in diplomacy. Uh, I do believe that over time, and it will take time, the more women we have in power, the more that the values of compassion and collaboration and, and uh, um, coexistence can triumph over the cold calculus of coercion. Um, it's not simple. I was talking to Cora Weiss, who many of you know, uh, last night about this, and we acknowledge that uh, it's not just any woman. Um, you, you, we can't be cloning Margaret Thatcher or anything like that. Um, but we, de we need more peace and justice women, and uh, we need more women leaders who will teach us, in Judy Lerner's words, peace is our only shelter. It's not about militarized security. We can't have security without peace. Um, so I, I just dropped Cora Weiss's name, uh, name dropped, uh, and that's because I'm about to introduce her. But let me say a couple things before, before she comes up here, because if it wasn't for Cora, I might not be standing here, and you might not be sitting here um, uh, at the William Sloan Coffin Awards. Um, of course, Cora put together the team that led the, or led the team that put together the merger of, of Sane and the Freeze, and um, you know that led to the recent merger that was Jim was just talking about uh, and the peace action that we have today. And it was uh, Cora who helped convince William Sloan Coffin to serve as uh, president of peace action and form the International Committee of Peace Action. And her influence just hasn't touched peace action. It's uh, rippled across the world, uh, across the world as Kate alluded to. Um, Cora helped draft and pass the groundbreaking Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace, and Security. And, and for all of that leadership, um, Cora was the natural first choice to be the recipient of the William Sloan Coffin Peacemaker Award that uh, tonight she awards to Judy. Um, so you can see all those strands of peace action history coming together, um, it, it sort of full circle tonight, and you can call it Cora's karma, and that's very good karma indeed. So uh, please welcome Cora Weiss. Hello, everyone. Bon appétit. It's very nice to see a lot of you. I can't see most of you. Um, <clears throat> and if it weren't for giving an award to Judy Lerner, none of us would be here. I told Kate, where are you, Kate, that I'm going to quit. I mean, you can take over. You're all ready. It's wonderful to know that there are people who are going to continue doing this work. So thank you very, very much. So let's celebrate the Nobel Peace Prize to Juan Manuel Santos for the amazing Colombia Peace Agreement, even though, even though it was narrowly, narrowly defeated. The Nobel Committee could have recognized that it takes two to make peace, and they could have done for Colombia what they did for South Africa and also recognized the FARC. It took four years of talks in Cuba, support from Norway, interest from the US and the Pope, and Colombian civil society who energized and propelled the peace process. 
One Million Women for Peace organization and women peace educators played a huge role in drafting the innovative proposals of that agreement. The agreement has a gender perspective and says that sexual violence is a crime against humanity. It recognizes women's rights and rights for the LGBTI communities. The women want to prepare for implementation of the agreement. On June 23rd, as you know, the ceasefire agreement was signed to end 52 years of war. Victims from both sides testified, innovative for the first time in peace agreement negotiations. The world was shocked when the referendum on October 2nd the International Day of Nonviolence and Gandhi's birthday, lost by less than 1% of the vote. 67% of eligible voters did not vote. Heavy rains kept people away, and President Santos thought he had the yes vote in his pocket. The Nobel Prize will strengthen Santos's hand against the former president, Uribe who worked against the approval, but he's now talking to Santos about how to move forward. Women peace educators are already in FARC territory, having gotten an agreement to bring teachers to the schools and start reconciliation and peace education. The ceasefire holds only until the end of October. The Uribe No Forces want to take away women's rights and install family values, code for no LGBT rights, no abortion, no reproductive rights, etc. No means not only no end to the war, no means no land redistribution, no banning of violence as a mechanism of political negotiation and other agreements that would have made this a role model peace agreement. Uribe has already lined up conservative and church leaders for the next round of talks. The Colombia peace agreement faces a similar path as the Philippine peace accord with the Moro Islamic Liberation Movement, led by a woman for the government side. It was approved by both sides, but didn't get Congress's approval. Yet, the ceasefire in that case is indefinite, and the agreement will come back for approval. And Mavic, who is here and is Filipina, just told me that even if Congress doesn't approve it, enough progress was made by the fact that the Moro Liberation Front and the government people and the Philippine people were talking to each other and agree on a number of progr progressive steps going forward. So it's an interesting case where a formal agreement may not be necessary to achieve peace. Let's look at our country. In 1961, it's a good country, basically. We heard Holly Near sing last night. Blanche and Claire were there. And there are really wonderful people in this country. Most of them are right in this room. But, <laughs> but Holly Near sings around the country. She sings around the world. And it's so refreshing. It's, it's, she's, you, you're not old enough to know who she is. So in 1961, Dagmar Wilson called a small group of women <coughs> to her house and told them about the dangerous consequences of atmospheric testing of what we called atomic bombs in those days. Judy Lerner was in her house, and that was the beginning of Women's Strike for Peace. And we went around the country. First, we had to learn about Strontium-90. Then we went around and had to tell 
people about it, especially women people, and newspaper editors. And Barry Commoner was a scientist at Washington University then. That was before he had ideas of becoming president of the United States. And he called on mothers to give him, send him our baby's first teeth. And he studied them for the presence of strontium-90, and to our horror, he found it. And that was all we needed to mobilize a huge public opinion campaign, which succeeded because by October 1963, President Kennedy signed the limited, or what I call the half-ban treaty, the limited uh, treaty to ban atmospheric testing of nuclear weapons. And Russia agreed. We should remind Russia of all the agreements we've made with them over the years. The women of Women's Strike for Peace gathered at the White House gates as witness to the historic signing. Jerry Wiesner, Kennedy's science advisor, beckoned the president to the window and said, look who's outside. And the women were standing at the gate, and Kennedy said to his wife, Jackie, bring them coffee. And she brought coffee and donuts. We ate donuts in those days, recognizing or acknowledging the role that Women's Strike for Peace played in creating the public opinion that enabled him to sign the agreement. Now, of course, there's no atmospheric testing, but there are nuclear weapons and you've got to abolish them. That's your first job. And what is the date that Bill Perry is coming here to speak? October 24th. And that's UN Day. So it's a double whammy. You can celebrate the UN Day and hear Bill Perry, who used to be the Defense Minister of the United States and who is going to spend the rest of his life making sure that there are no more nuclear weapons in this world. I'm just going to move along to a bunch of examples of uh, <clears throat> diplomacy. In 1969, at the height of the Vietnam War, the Canadian Voice of Women invited women from the women's unions of North and South Vietnam. They couldn't come to this country, of course. We were at war. Women's Strike for Peace went to Canada. We were sitting on the grass, licking ice cream cones. It was July 4th, our most patriotic holiday. And in the process of talking, Winyak Zung, who was a journalist from Saigon, invited me to invite three American women, two other women, to come to Vietnam, to Hanoi. It was just before, that was in August, in uh, July of 69, and in November of 69, we had the huge demonstration uh, in Washington led by uh, Charlie Goodell, his name isn't Charlie, was it? A sen uh, the Republican senator and George McGovern. They actually held hands. It was probably the last time a Republican and Democratic senator ever held hands. So we went uh, when that demonstration was over. <coughs> Nixon was perpetuating the war on the grounds that the Vietnamese were torturing our prisoners of war and uh, we had to keep fighting them. And our position was if we weren't bombing the North, they wouldn't shoot the planes down, they wouldn't be any prisoners of war. But instead, we decided to do something that has never happened in wartime before, which is what we did for years, doing things that never happened before. And we brought a proposal to the Vietnamese women, the women's union, because you, you know that in wartime, you're not allowed to talk to the enemy. And in a communist country at that time, there were no civil society organizations, no non-governmental organizations. So the women's union was the closest we could find, or we could get to, who are non-governmental. And we brought them a proposal that we wanted to take the pretext for continuing the war away from Nixon. 
and we would hand deliver mail to prisoners of war if you would let them write letters back every single month and we would have the list of who in fact was a pilot prisoner in the North Vietnamese prison camp. That, they approved it easily, I mean quickly, and they gave us the first batch of three, over 300 letters to bring back to this country, which established the first list of who was alive in a Vietnamese prison camp. This is 1969, just before Christmas. And we did that for three years. We were called Women Citizen Diplomats. And I think, well, I was going to tell you a story about the UN Charter, but um, it would take too long. <laughs> there were two Brazilian women on the Brazilian, do you know this, Anwar? There were two Brazilian women on, the, on Brazil's delegation to the San Francisco Conference in 1945 that produced the Charter of the United Nations. And they insisted on putting gender and women into the Charter. Every, I always thought that Eleanor Roosevelt gave us our rights in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But apparently, these two women, Bertha Lutz and Mal, Melvina Bernardino, persuaded the delegates from 50 countries, only 30 of which had allowed women to vote in their countries, 30 out of the 50. And the 50 countries said, okay, it's in Article 1 and Article 8 of the Charter, and it's a document that you should really have at home on your night table. I can't live without it. And look who's gonna take it out of his pocket. Ambassador Admiral Chowdhury, hooray. So I like the new Secretary General of the UN, Antonio Guterres, but he's not a good woman, and he doesn't have the lengthy and broad history of ex experience of at least some of the women candidates who the Security Council ignored and actually humiliated in a way, the way they treated them. They kept voting them down. And this huge global campaign to have a woman finally become Secretary General of the United Nations didn't succeed and can't now for a number of years. So it was a big disappointment. Fortunately, Guterres comes from a small country, which is very valuable, good not a big power, um, and was the head of the Socialist International, which gives him some credits. So, and the, he's of course the world's leading expert on refugees because he led the UN Refugee Agency for the last 10 years. So we've got to expect uh, some good things from him. And we should start to demand them. So let's talk about uh, Syria, because that war absolutely has got to be stopped. You know that the cessation of hostilities agreement with Russia was broken on September 20th. Bombing has resumed. And the death and destruction followed by starvation, cannot be defended on any ground. Before the agreement was broken, however, the first women's advisory board for any peace talks was established by the Syrian UN envoy, Staffan de Mistura. Not good enough, the women said. We want to be among the decision makers, not on an advisory board. <clears throat> which is called for by Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace, and Security, which was drafted by a small team of women from civil society and the staff of UNIFEM. 
And if it weren't for this guy sitting over here, Onworld Chowdhury, ambassador, it never would have passed unanimously. He is non-stoppable, unstoppable. <coughs> I have a cold. He's an unstoppable champion of women, peace education, peace education, and women. And he just goes around the world talking about how important it is to have both. Women at the table, every single decision-making table, and peace education in every school. The Yemeni peace talks, quote, sacrificed women in order to bring two reluctant parties together. Arab women claim that the inclusion of women in peace talks will lead to long-lasting, sustainable peace. And research from both the Philippines and Colombia shows that including women in peace processes significantly increases the likelihood of reaching an agreement. In Liberia, 2003, women circled the negotiating house, refusing to let the men leave until they signed the peace agreement. It worked. Imagine, says Gloria Steinem, whom you'll hear from soon, what the women could do if they sat, if they came inside and sat at the table. Lema Bowie became a Nobel Peace Laureate for leading the successful women's campaign. Take the Irish Friday Agreement, Good Friday Agreement. It was facilitated by Maine Senator George Mitchell. Women asked for a seat at the table. Mitchell said only political parties are invited meaning only men. So the two women went home, called all the women together, created the Northern Ireland Women's Coalition, returned to Mitchell, and got two seats. Monica McWilliams and Avila Kilmurray wouldn't let the men proceed in the negotiations until they got human rights institutionalized. After 30 years of the Troubles, the Irish Human Rights Commission was established in 1998 and remains a role model for other peace agreements. Those women became citizen diplomats and are consulted by peacemakers from around the world. Iran. I spoke at length with Wendy Sherman. She's the first woman Under Secretary of State since 1959. Secretary of State John Kerry has gotten all the accolades for the Iran deal. And he deserves many of them. His commitment to diplomacy has not been seen for many years. It's been a terrific record. But Wendy and a woman from the European Union spent more time with the Iranians than all the other people put together, got to know them, and earned, gained their trust so that they would believe in the negotiating process in what was taking place. I give Wendy Sherman huge credit for the Iran deal, which kept Iran from getting the nuclear bomb no idea of getting nuclear and prevented Iran from getting bombed. It avoided a war, a major war. At the Rio Olympics, two young girl gymnasts from South and North Korea took selfies together. I think they started youth sports diplomacy. <coughs> Speaking of the Koreas, I'll end my list of examples of why young people should study diplomacy, consider the diplomatic core, or get into a peace or women's organization 
and cons can consider what can be done on the civil society level to bring peace and make social change happen. Women and young men. But the young men should remember that peace agreements last longer when women are at the table. Under the Charter of the UN, <coughs> under the Charter of the UN, all member states agree to carry out decisions of a Security Council, which are international laws. Security Council Resolution 1325 calls for women at all decision-making tables. A negotiation should never proceed without women at the table. <coughs> Gloria Steinem went with a group of international women to North Korea two years ago, a year and a half ago. Crossed the DMZ, Anne was there. Anne, where are you? She was on the walk. They crossed the DMZ, met with women in both North Korea and South Korea. They went to see if the women of the Koreas would agree that it's time to bring the Korean War to an end. It's been 63 years since the Koreas were divided, the only nation to remain divided since World War II. The temporary armistice agreement to re <clears throat> signed in 1953, promised to reconvene the negotiations in three months to replace the ceasefire with a binding peace accord. The North and South Korean women agreed with the international women that it's time to call for a permanent peace agreement for reunification, reconciliation, and peace education. They insisted that women be significantly represented in the negotiations in the spirit of Security Council Resolution 1325, and <coughs> they came home. Two weeks ago, the women held a press conference announcing that they had sent a letter to Ban Ki-moon saying that he has 100 days left to start a new peace process to leave a legacy of diplomacy for peace in Korea. The letter received a lot of press. No reply from the Secretary General. So we've seen a lot of victories in diplomacy. The reopening of relations with Cuba, the Iran deal, Philippine Moro Liberation Front, and now the Colombia Agreement, which must succeed. I would like to propose, if I may, to you, that no matter what else you do, let's declare the 75th anniversary of the United Nations, the year 2020, which also stands for perfect vision, the year to implement the Charter's promise to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. It's time to abolish war. It's time to make sure that women are, are at all decision-making tables. We wouldn't have to worry about peace agreements if we prevented war. There's always time to talk not fight. Thank you.
that we all care about. I think you and I first met outside the Pentagon, marching with Bell Labs, <laughs> and uh, then in the auditorium of the State Department, I think, where Bell was showing people bits of illegal weapons from Vietnam to prove that we were using illegal weapons. I remember that Senator Javits was so annoyed that <laughs> at, at, at our, uh, I don't know, but just our impoliteness, I guess, that he said he was going to continue to be against the war in spite of us. And it makes all that. <laughs> that was a train trip that we took to Washington together in order to have that demonstration. And it was the first of very, very many uh, times of standing in the kitchen, somebody's kitchen, making plans of your kindness and coolness and common sense seasoning, bellies, outrageousness, and fortitude, and brashness. Um, really, I don't think that those groups could have gone forward without you. So for a lifetime of supporting peace in a way that makes you know that the means are the ends, because you always chose the best means, uh, and for the great honor of this award, both its honor to you and your honor to me. I send you love and a hug, and I hope we together make it to a hug. Cora, could you join me? I think you should come here. Yes. <laughs> This is why we came tonight, don't forget. <laughs> Indeed. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, wonderful. Just wonderful. Um, I can't did, you, did you see Gloria on the front page of the Metropolitan section this morning? Yeah. I didn't see it this morning. Why not? Don't they sell, send it to you in Elmhurst? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Would somebody arrange to send the New York Times to her, please? We'll make sure. No, I'm speaking first. Yeah, you're right. hold on. Here. You stay right here. You stay right here. We always have this problem. Well, you sisters are I don't think we had any problems. I didn't yeah, think I had we had love. any problems. Let me hold you. Okay. Right. you now listen. <laughs> dear, dear Judy. Excuse my back. I am so happy and so honored to have been asked to present you with Peace Action's William Sloan Coffin Award for Peace and Justice. Before I tell you and your many friends gathered here why you are getting this award, I want to tell everyone about you and Bill Coffin. You loved Bill, yeah, but we all know you love almost everyone. <laughs> Bill was special. He played the piano and he sang. You loved that because as a young woman, you wanted to be a singer. That's really? right. <laughs> you also admired him because he could gather people together of different persuasions and convince them about a nuclear-free world at peace. Bill, as we know, was president of St. Freeze and persuaded many people to join the campaign for peace and a nuclear-free world. You, Judy Lerner, also gather people together. No one gives better parties. No one brings people of different ages together the way you do, the young and the not so young. <laughs> We're in the not so young. Or the old. Me. <laughs> <laughs> and you persuade people also to campaign against nuclear weapons, to call for no more war, to work together with other peace groups, to learn about the United Nations, 
and to call for education for peace in our schools. Will this happen, I asked you once. It's worth a try, you said. <laughs> we have a message from Ria Pujeda, the first person to staff the Sane Freeze International Office for the United Nations in 1986. Irving, our dear Irving, your late husband, was the UN representative then. Ria Pujeda said, many thanks for the leadership, commitment, and passion that you, Irving, Judy, and the Sane Freeze members provided in making the work of the international office possible. We had a great team. Wishing you all the best, Ria. Nice. That should start the list of reasons why you are here, and I am here, to hand you this beautiful award. Wait until it's, okay. it's ready. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Everybody rushing. I knew it. <laughs> Not everyone has a public relations professional for a son. <laughs> but your son, David, not only loves you, but admires you for your life's work. I asked him what he would say. And without any hesitation, he said, you've been consistent in your work, going back to Women's Strike for Peace, where we met in 1961 your trip to Cuba with a group of women, to Vietnam in 71 with Dave McReynolds and Joe Ergo, the Vietnam vet, wow. and Nairobi in 85 and Beijing in 95 to the World Women's Forums. It looks like you learned a lot of geography belonging <laughs> to the women and peace movements. <laughs> Davy, as you call your son, continued, you were fighting against nuclear weapons when it was unpopular and at the same time supported the civil rights movement, hosting freedom riders and getting hell from the locals on all counts. Wow. <laughs> I loved reading about Clara Lemlick, the leader of the 20,000 shirtwaist workers in 1909 who was blacklisted for her labor union work. You were a labor leader, too. Yes. That's right. You've done a lot of things. <laughs> and you received the Social Activist Award given in Clara Lemick, Lemick, Lemlick's name. Excuse me. It was given to women working for the larger good their entire lives, yeah. like you. <laughs> for all of that, for your dedication to the United Nations, for your commitment to the empowerment of women and to their equal rights, for bringing young people with not so young people to all tables where discuss discussions of world events happen and decisions are made. On behalf of Peace Action, I am delighted to give you the William Sloan Coffin Award for Peace and Justice 2016. Maybe not so we can see it. Thank you. 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 Thank Yes, indeed. Could time. I bet you think you're through and you can eat and drink. But I have one more thing to say to you today, <laughs> my you good, dear, good, good dear time. friends and family. I am thrilled with this award from Peace Action, and your confidence in me is overwhelming. Uh, one cannot hope for a bigger gift than your confidence in my work as a peace action devotee. I wholly hope that I reach 100 years old and can look back at all of my work, 
and the struggle for a world without war. This can only happen if all of you here continue this struggle. Together, we will not only ensure peace and equality, but we will do something else sort of significant. We will disrupt aging. Woo <laughs> we will not be defined by age or sex or race. I believe that age and experience can expand my life and ensure that the wisdom that I have gained from all of these years will help me to continue the path to peace and equality. So let me assure you all, my dear friends, that I am looking forward to the years ahead and not looking back. We will continue to make a difference for our children, for our grandchildren, for the nation, yes, and for the world. So I look forward to seeing you again when I reach 100 in 2020. Yeah. Yeah. Nice, nice. I want to cry. Hey, y'all two are hot, you know that. <laughs> and I have your award right here. Except I can't walk very well. I got you. <laughs> Let us go. Watch your stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, Judy Lerner. <laughs> 95 years, we should all be so fortunate and we should all be so dedicated. And thank you, Cora Weiss. History in the room, great words, great people, all of our legacies. Now, this completes the award part of our gala. And I'd like to now move us towards a tribute part that um, really has many hearts in here just blowing up with joy, great memories, and an endless love. I want to bring to the microphone as we move to do a tribute to Carol Hurston, I want to bring Ken Epstein. All right, Ken. I'm fired up tonight. Yeah. Are you fired up? Yes. yes. I, I will get to the microphone, but I just have to say a few words out here. And that is, uh, what a great honor to uh, bring to you uh, someone that I love. And her name is Carol Houston. Yeah. I mean, how are you doing tonight? Yeah. I'm doing great. I mean, what could be better than this, you know? To talk about somebody I love, somebody that I care about, somebody who is my mentor. Um, and I want to even go a little bit further and say she is my Athena. Well, it goes like this. Um, you know, I don't want to play too much on the Odyssey and Homer and such, but mentor really wasn't the guy to get the job done. It took Athena to come by and an impersonate mentor, and that's how the story begins. So there you have it. She is my mentor, but really, she is my Athena. So. Uh, Carol taught me a few organizing lessons that I'd like to share with you this evening. And uh, I'm just going to get right to it. Organizing lesson number one. Are you ready? Yes. Yes. Organize yourself first with friends and food whenever possible. And then you can organize for peace afterwards. <laughs> Never, ever overlook a table full of friends as the greatest engine of organization imaginable. Look around your table. Look at your friends. Look at your family. You are the peace movement. How many dinners, how many lunches, how many drinks <laughs> at her house? 
Think about all of that. And with every drink that she served us, and we weren't always paying attention, we agreed to one new assignment. <laughs> many drinks, many assignments, peace <laughs> activism. <laughs> One of Carol's greatest achievements in my direct experience with her um, and work done with many of you here tonight was to unite uh, downstate peace action, you remember this, with upstate peace action to create, to create peace action of New York State, the very entity that we represent this evening. Organizing lesson number one. Okay, organizing lesson number two. Outrageous and outlandish ideas can be the parents of sane actions. As careful a planner as Carol was, see organizing lesson number one, she was endlessly creative. For Carol, it was never about the possible versus the impossible. It was never about that. It was always about whether we should try the impossible anyway. For her, the ordinary laws of physics were not applicable. But her view of physics had real world implications. I've told the story before, I have to tell it again. We were running late for the Greenwich Village Halloween Parade. We had a 30-foot inflatable missile inside that truck that absolutely had to reach anxious peace activists at the parade site. They were saying, where's our missile? With mounting police presence as we sped on, barricades impeding Carol's full steam ahead approach to city traffic, we needed a miracle. Well, Carol might be to me Athena and all that, but a job needed, needed doing. And you know, if you can disregard the laws of physics as Carol used to do, what are two or three police barricades <laughs> for me to jump out of that car and move them aside, run back to the car so that Carol could gun that engine and run it? <laughs> and make our way to that parade site. Let me tell you tonight, I have never been so happy to be next to an inflated cruise missile. <laughs> Organizing lesson number three. Organize with the next generation for the next generation. Oddly, I present this lesson on the basis of Carol's love for bridge. She always talked about it. Her friends, the game. The authorities at Wikipedia tell us that bridge is a game of skill played with randomly dealt cards, which makes it a game of chance, but also a game of tactics, featuring built-in randomness and imperfect knowledge. Built-in randomness, imperfect knowledge, the interplay of tactics and chance? Well, it sounds like me of all the elements that makes organizing for peace the lifelong adventure that it is. Now, a central aspect of Bridge is the way you are always building now for that auction, that culminating point. And to do this rightly, you have to be able to see the actual in the possible. You've got to see the realized in the incipient. You've got to let go of what appears to be strong in favor of that which really has long-term strength. Now, many of us have joked about Carol's age. I mean, not her real age, no, of course not. But the age she always seemed to be. You know, Carol always reached out to the next generation because she knew that's where strength also resides. The ultimate long suit. The people and the energy without whom a peace movement could be possible. Back in 2001, when Peace Action of New York State was literally headquartered in a closet 
that educators for social responsibility used to have. She brought in Jennifer, a Beacon High School student, to begin an internship with Peace Action. Once again, defining the laws of physics. I mean, this office was so small, all you had to do was reach out anywhere and touch a wall. I mean, it was small. It was a closet. Carol um, brought in Jennifer. Abby is here tonight. Uh, Abby also being um, a teacher of Jennifer at Beacon. Jennifer took the helm. Uh, you may remember her, Jennifer Hyman, and she continued her work for many years, culminating in an award uh, that she received at this very dinner uh, a number of years ago. My mentor, my Athena, Carol, organize yourselves first to organize for peace afterwards. Organize, be not afraid, organize around outlandish ideas. Have the courage, like Carol did, to be crazy. Be crazy for peace. Why not? Just go for it. And finally, organize with and for the next generation. In a famous t-shirt paraphrasing a uh, passage from Living My Life, do you remember this t-shirt? Emma Goldman. It's not my revolution if I can't dance to it. Well, I think Carol might say in reference to the rest of this glorious evening, the world does not have a chance if peace activists can't get up and dance. <laughs> so, on this glorious evening in which the achievements of many women who have worked for generations. A lovely, wonderful evening. My honor to present this tribute to Carol. And also, my joy, and to invite all of you uh, to give peace the chance by also just getting up and dancing. Let it be. Thank you. <laughs> A proclamation both to Julie Lerner and to Carol Hurst Houston. Got it? <laughs> Carol Houston. And I won't read it, I'll just present it to the family and we'll move right on to the video. Did you, did you 
Two things to do. One the thing, and then I'll come right to you. First, I want to ask Shelly Mayer, who is a member of the New York State Assembly, to come forward. And then I want to ask the beautiful daughter, Akira Houston, to come forward. Amy, would you? Please. So it's really a treat to present this proclamation from the New York State Assembly to my friend Amy Houston to honor her mother posthumously. Uh, on behalf of the New York State Assembly and my very good friend and colleague, Gary Pretlow, together Gary and I represent um, the city of Yonkers and Mount Vernon, but we are tremendous supporters. And today we are presenting this citation to uh, salute Carol Houston posthumously. Uh, and I won't re read it all except to say we had an outstanding individual, one who is worthy of the esteem of both the community and the great state of New York. And today we honor her and give this to Amy on her behalf. Indeed. Oh. Amy, stay just one moment. And we have one more tribute. Oh. <laughs> Dear friends, brothers and sisters, peacemakers, it has been a wonderful evening. Glorious tribute to our friend Judy Lerner and also Carol Houston. And I would like to end it with a poem written by a man called Kamal Dawood. And it's about a child. And because we are concerned about children, what we do, we do for the children. We do for their lives, so that they will have lives. And so in the words of Kamal Dawood, there is a child's hand in the street. It is small. It should be attached to a three or four year old. You cannot tell 
if it is the hand of Palestinian child, of Israeli child, you cannot tell if it was blown here from suicide bomb blasts or shelling from an Israeli tank. It's just a small, bloody hand in the gray of the street. Someone weeps! <laughs> insane with the weight of this image. Someone who has held that hand taught the child to count the fingers on that hand in Hebrew. Or Arabic. There is a baby's hand in the middle of this Middle Eastern road. And you cannot tell if the child's parents read the Koran or the Torah. It's just there, small and bloody without a smile and laughter attached to it. So look away, we are told, it's just unfortunate collateral damage. May there always be sunshine, may there always be me. May we always be family. May we always be free. May there always be sunshine. May there always be me. May there always be family. May we always be free. Well, <laughs> it's time to dance. Ladies and gentlemen, Judy Lerner, Carol Houston, and we, People of Peace. And I often think to myself, this would be fun, George. You could be playing tennis, but there's something inside of you that does not allow you to just go and make believe that nothing is going on. I need to move this. Will it bother your mic? Will it bother your microphone? <laughs> 